Obviously, I'm, I'm director, inaugural director of the Sydney Harbour Research Program, which has now been going for four years, and that, that is a very interdisciplinary program. Uh, it has a very strong outreach component. We have economists, microbiologists, oceanographers, social scientists, everyone, everyone's getting in on the action. And we've grown from no funding to quite a substantial program involving 35 post-PhD researchers and a whole suite of very active students. Um, some of what I'm going to talk to you about today is about that, but mostly I introduce that concept because uh, what the talk is about today, what the science is about today is the coast, which means it's really about all of Australia and Australians' population because <clears throat> and this thought I'd better put a photo up of a local bit of coast because this is the area where we all live and we work and increasingly so. Uh, and Australia is 86% uh, of us living within 50 kilometres of the coast and that proportion is still increasing. <clears throat> all of our industry or most of our industry is based on the coast. 97% of our trade is by ship and uh, we're obviously a resource uh, economy and we're a bulk commodity exporter and so that's part of the reason for that. But also all of our recreational activities tend to take place on the coast. We build our houses on the coast and um, we, we use the waterways that enter the coastline in that way. I've just, um, oh, I put this up when I was feeling hungry. This is just a little uh, kind of overview of the talk and clearly I needed dinner when I created this. But um, essentially what I'm going to talk to you about are the multiple stresses that are affecting our coastline. And I've just literally on Monday put in the first draft of the Department of Environment, the Federal Department of Environment's coast chapter for the State of Environment report, which is due to be tabled in Parliament in December. So our first full draft is in, so I know too much about the coast. Any questions you've got, just let me know. Um, so we'll talk about the multiple stresses. Then we'll go into some of the hardcore science, the science that we've used and developed over the last few years for better monitoring of coastal ecosystem health. What worked, what hasn't worked. And if, we, if I'm really, really quick, which I doubt very much, um, we'll get on to dessert, which is the microplastics, the new emerging contaminants. Just a quick image to show you all the people who have been involved in the research program. And uh, they involve a huge range of post-PhD researchers along the bottom and also uh, students and postdoctoral researchers. If you can see a photo of my lab group up the top left and some international collaborators top right and also my funding uh, bodies. I do that now in case I run out of time. So we're talking about ecosystems that are exposed to multiple stresses and, or pressures. If we talk about the pressures first, now obviously climate change has got to be the key pressure at the moment, um, or carbon dioxide production and greenhouse gas production is the, is the pressure, I should say. The stresses are a little bit uh, removed from that. But we um, are looking down the barrel of huge changes in coastal environments as a consequence of climate related change and that's got to be one of the key pressures. Secondarily we have shipping activity all the way around the coast that's just the circles indicate the number um, of ships going in and out of those ports and that is increasing. We have oil and gas facilities that are also increasing right the way around the coast. Uh, these are just maps from the 2011 state of environment report so they've all been updated for the new draft. We have coastal fisheries, co commercial fisheries on the left hand, so this is resource extraction happening all the way around the coast. Uh, we have local state-based fisheries as well, but also recreational fisheries, and I couldn't find a map, of course, of pressures of recreational fisheries because they are one of the key knowledge gaps in our understanding of pressures on coastal systems. Uh, recreational fishing is incredibly diffuse and it is also a very... Um, varied and so there haven't been a huge number of attempts to quantify the amount of fishing extraction taking place through recreational fishing and ov obviously we often revert to proxies such as numbers of fishing licenses and it's not a very good proxy for resource extraction so that's one of our key knowledge gaps but we know it is a pressure because when we do create sanctuary zones or no-take zones we see enormous changes in the number and size of targeted fish and that's a pattern that's now appearing right the way around the coast. Uh, we also have, of course, population density. And this is coastal population density, top left. 
uh, and that's increasingly moved towards the coast. It was all always concentrated on the coast, but it's more so, and I'll show you some of that in a minute. And obviously vegetation loss or vegetation transformation. So this is where native vegetation is, tr is transformed into other sources of vegetation and or urban and industrial areas. So obviously very concentrated on the coast. Just a quick note to show you and to prove that the increasing rate of urban populations near the coast is really still accelerating. On the left you have 1991 to 2014, on the right you have 2011 to 2014. So this is just the most recent data we've analysed uh, for the coast. I'll try and get the button. Um, so this is distance to the coast. On the right hand side is right next to the coast. Out here is 50 kilometres if you can't see it. And these are the patterns of increasing population density. You can see it increased towards the coast here, but over the last four years we've got an increasing trend. And we're particularly seeing pulses around the big cities. So these are kind of populations of people who are living within a relatively close distance to the major cities such as Sydney and Melbourne. And um, just to point out, South Australia, you guys are lagging behind, man. What are you doing? One more child each. Um, <laughs> no, so obviously the point is that these populations vary from state to state and some states have got more, more pressure than others. I just need to change the scale for the South Australian one and you'd see the same pattern. Land use change is another great way of documenting this sort of, sorts of pressure. So these are numbers that we just crunched last week as well. So change in registered properties. So this is properties that are urban registration of properties that are urban as we get close to the coast. You can see it's going up through the roof uh, and um, density of properties like that. Peri-urban and rural property registrations are dropping and that's what we think is as people move towards the coast to live there, then the number of people who are actually have rural or peri-urban registrations drops. And that's something that again, it's concentrated around New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, Western Australia and not a huge amount happening in South Australia, although I could scale it up. So what happens when you have all these pressures concentrated one around one location is you get a huge number of different stresses associated with those pressures and they all interact. So you can sit down and you can write lists and lists and lists of different stresses associated with all these activities and each one of these will interact with the other. And one of the key knowledge gaps we have is how those stresses interact. Are the impacts synergistic? Are they antagonistic? Are they cumulative? And for resource managers, and one of the things we working to develop in New South Wales are ways of actually dealing with these cumulative pressures or at the very least assessing them so that they're not ignored and that each stressor is not dealt with individually. We know that we lose biological diversity in response to a lot of these stresses and the one, the pressures and stresses that have been most documented are things like biodiversity loss, habitat change, uh, over exploitation. But increasingly we're understanding that chemical pollution is also responsible for biodiversity loss. This is a review I did in 2009 showing that contaminated areas in coastal ecosystems were on average 40% less diverse than their non-contaminated counterparts. Um, so that's something that can be ignored. But when we look at all these stresses and we think about what as environmental managers we're measuring as proxies for these stresses or measuring as response variables, it's a really complicated and, and somewhat bizarre situation because the sorts of data that you can find for the state of the environment's coast, for the stresses that they're facing, is pretty much in this slide in terms of national data. And you can tell very quickly, you can see this is light, sea level rise, heat anomalies, chlorophyll A. The one thing that binds all of this data set together, the one kind of key thread, is it's all remotely sensed. You, these, these are things that we can get very quickly and very easily and very cheaply. But are they the relevant stressor measures or response variables? Arguably not. And when you go down a level into what's being measured by the state governments around the nation and what's being re measured by the local councils around the nation, 
it's not much more complicated than what those remote sensing things are showing you. So in general, what's done at a, across a state, for example, in terms of measuring variables, would be things like pelagic, salinity, light, temperature, nutrients, chlorophyll, things that can be logged, things that can be measured with water quality monitors, not biological variables, not complex ecological responses that might be more appropriate or more sensitive, or in fact to be the things that we care about because they're ecosystem services and biodiversity. In terms of stresses, the things that we probably should be looking at are measures that integrate through time, rather than these things that change very quickly, that are in fact quite difficult to interpret because of the rate of change. If we looked at variables that were actually chronic stresses, such as sediment organic matter as a measure of nutrient enrichment in our estuaries, sediment metals as a measure of legacy pollutants, pesticides, herbicides, emerging contaminants as a measure of new introductions. Those sorts of things could be much better variables for us to assess. So when we realised that this wasn't being done and that we didn't have good monitoring programs, not just in Australia but around the world for estuaries and coasts, we realised we've got to get out there and prove, prove it. What is going to work? What's not going to work? What can we adopt right now? as much better measures of the stresses and responses to those stresses in our coastal systems. So we got out and about, and when I say we, I mean my whole team of researchers, I rarely got to go out. I sat there writing grant applications. Um, but we got out and about and we did everything. We measured everything that we thought. We measured the short-term stuff and the long-term stuff. We measured all sorts of biological response variables that we thought might be important. We even looked at fish uh, because people care about fish, uh, even though we didn't think they would respond to some of these stresses because they're really tough. And we went out to a whole range of estuaries. This is a um, study that went over about four years in New South Wales, heavily modified to really pristine estuaries, and went through loads of sites within each of those locations and measured everything that we could in all of those places over a couple of years. Uh, seven estuary, oh, sorry, yep seven estuaries in the first year and then we went to ten in the second year just to nail it completely. So what did we find? I'm going to move pretty quickly through this. Of course the estuaries were differentiated on the basis of background contamination. We know we've got legacy issues in all of our coastal ecosystems but particularly in the sediments where most contaminants will be bound and settle down to the seafloor. We know that when those sediments are resuspended, they cause ongoing impacts within those systems and they cause problems for the infauna and the bedded sediments and the animals that eat them. So sure enough, our coppers, our leads, our zincs, our um, PAHs were all differentiable when you looked at the heavily modified estuaries versus the relatively unmodified estuaries. And that was a completely different trajectory to the whole range of natural environmental gradient that you would find along those estuaries, indicated by salinity and temperature and, and DO, etc. So we could differentiate our, our estuaries. These smiley faces are for the smiley people who got to work on these topics because they all worked out really well and responded really well. There's a whole lot of sad faces for people who got to work on um, parts or, or biological measures that really didn't respond at all to these gradients and are not good measures or proxies. And all I can say quickly, because I don't have much time, is don't touch the zooplankton. Um, but what we can say, so benthic larval fish. So these are baby fish that are predominantly on the seafloor of these places. Very, very clear patterns of uh, different community compositions that relate to the background contaminant concentrations or the level of modification and or the seagrass availability within estuaries. So a really good, if people care about fish, go target those baby larval fish that are exposed to the stresses in the, in the sea floor. Uh, they're a pain though because they're quite difficult to identify and you need world experts, which we had, to do that. But you do get really clear results. If you go just a, a step above to the larval fish in the pelagic environment, much more variable, much less associated with the stresses that are in those estuaries, no clear signal. If you go to the juvenile fish uh, through beach sanding, for example, or you go to the adult fish, again, 
much more variable, much more mobile, no clear patterns of response. And we would expect that because fish are like us. They have detoxification mechanisms. As adults, they're likely to be far less sensitive to environmental stresses than juvenile fish or invertebrates or microbes. So that was our first clear message to everybody who's looking at uh, ecosystem health in these systems and wants to look at fish. If you're not looking at extractive industries such as fishing, recreational fishing, then and you are looking more at chemical stresses or environmental stresses, maybe head for the babies. Uh, environmental biomarkers of stress. Oh. So we looked at cellular biomarkers. People like to use cellular biomarkers. They preempt mortality, so you're looking at something that's a little bit more sensitive than death. And uh, we developed uh, a biomarker for the Sydney rock oyster. Probably would work with Austria and Gazi as well, your local uh, oyster. It's um, great because you're getting measures of stress that actually have an ecological or a biological response that's very important. So the level of stress that the oysters we deployed in some of these estuaries were at is equivalent to what will happen when you get complete breakdown uh, or failure of reproduction. So you've got not only a marker that's important, but you've got something that relates back to productivity. And so obviously don't eat the oysters in Botany Bay, Port Kembla or Port Jackson. Um, elsewhere it looks pretty good. We looked at sessile invertebrates, sponges, sea squirts, bryzoans, uh, anything that will come to us and settle on a settlement panel, really easy technique to use. And again, responding very clearly to background stressor levels. And you can see the contours laid over these community plots are background sediment contamination in the bedded sediment. The communities that we're looking at are way above the bedded sediment. So if you think you haven't got a problem because the sediment contamination is gonna stay in the bottom, that's not true in most of these estuaries. There's enough tidal action, storm action, and vessel action for those sediments to be continually resuspended and change the community living well above it. Um, one important aspect of that, and something we've been working on for many years, is the interaction of stresses. So I've been talking about contaminants for a little bit. What I'm going to talk to you now about is to um, the interaction of contamination with biological invasion. So about 10 years ago, I thought I had a, one of those eureka moments. They, they increasingly happen, actually, as I get older, because I forget what ideas I've already had. <laughs> and then I have them again. It's great. But one, this was an original one, and uh, essentially hypothesised that copper contamination in particular would be facilitating biological invasion, because we painted on the bottom of our boats. We therefore, s whoever gets in on the, as hull fouling species, will necessarily be highly tolerant to that particular contaminant. And then it just so happens to be, unfortunately, the major industrial sewerage and urban metal toxicant in the whole of the world. So if you look in most of your sediments, that's what you'll find, copper, lead and zinc, copper being the most toxic to marine invertebrates. Um, so we, we spent some time and about 10 years doing the, the background testing or the field testing, et cetera. But this was the first evidence uh, from a large-scale field study where you got clear increases in the percent cover of introduced species and in the richness of introduced species as sediment contamination increased. The natives dropped out, species richness didn't change, and the cryptogenic, which are the species we don't have good understanding of where they come from. They don't take up a lot of cover in these communities, but there are quite a few of them, and that just speaks to our taxonomic clarity or lack thereof in Australia, but they didn't do anything. So this was confirmation of about 10 years of work that what we were seeing and what we're predicting and hypothesizing in our experimental studies actually makes a difference in the real world. I'm gonna skip that one. But the important component of that is it is it gives us hope for the management of introduced species. Introduced species in marine ecosystems can sometimes, often, almost 90% of the time, be put in the too hard basket for natural environmental resource managers because once they're in the system, it's very hard to get rid of them. This offers an opportunity for us to tip the balance back in favour of native organisms if we actually clean up legacy contaminants because when we, we found, when we reduce sediment contamination, when we reduce water-based metal contamination, the native community was favoured and the proportion of non-Indigenous species taking up space in those systems always dropped. So it, it just opens up another opportunity for movement. 
just want to uh, go quickly to the most exciting component of the work that we did in these systems and something that I think opens up for gov government, university and local councils as an opportunity to have a really good ecological response variable that we can measure in sediment communities. We obviously, there's some pictures of some of the estuaries and you can see huge differences in, in their level of development. Uh, what we were trying to do is get a better way of working with the mud. Now the mud is where all the organic enrichment ends up from nutrient and agricultural activity. It's where all the contaminants end up. And it's also the most dominant ecosystem in all of our coastal and ocean environments. It has an incredible array of biological diversity within it and it plays an important role, sediment stabilisation, productivity, nitrogen cycling, the production of atmospheric gases is also heavily controlled by sedimentary communities in these systems. So an, a really important target for environmental management, one that's often overlooked because it just looks like mud, um, but also because it's really hard to work with. So we compared the old techniques with our, some of these new molecular techniques and we were able to show that some, the new techniques are ready to go and they're much stronger and faster. So looking at these communities, looking at the in-fauna, the conventional technique, you sift the mud, you spend hours trying to identify the species that you can. Most of them aren't described in Australia because of uh, you know, lack of taxonomic clarity. You get as far as you can, maybe family, maybe order, and then you, you try and analyse it in relation to environmental variables. The alternative is some of the new sequencing techniques. And I'll just show you what you, what you can, how to compare these two. So, what we did was we matched our data sets. Now you can use targeted gene sequencing in these systems for a whole range of different groups. Right, what I'm showing you here is just morphological, old school approach, so sorting and sieving, what you get. And then molecular techniques where we've targeted a particular gene, the ADNS gene, to get taxonomic information about the eukaryotes. It's not gonna get all of them, but it's gonna get a lot. And so when we just match the data sets, you can see you've got two graphs here that look pretty much like pizzas, right? You can't, you can't tell what's going on. Uh, and that's when we've just used the same level of taxonomic clarity that we have in the morphological technique and just to, like kind of filtered our molecular data so that we could, we could show you what's happening here. And it's pretty messy. If we use the full taxonomic data set from the molecular approach, and this is not an expensive approach. This is about 160 bucks a sample. Oh, sorry, it's half that, 80 bucks a sample. Look at the level of distinction you're getting between estuaries. These estuaries are dividing almost entirely. And not only that, not only are you getting, so this is the old school, this is the molecular techniques. A whole suite of different groups that we never count are coming up as differentiating those estuaries. And most importantly, we doubled the amount of variation in the biological community that we could explain with our environmental variables. So all of a sudden, all those impact assessments where you get non-significant results, we are starting to get much greater clarity and we're starting to understand the drivers of each of those components of these really important informal systems. Is that all there is? I don't know because I don't know how much time I've got, but I'm going to rush through until someone stops me. Um, so that's just the eukaryotes. You know, we tend to be focused on them as multi, uh, as metazoans ourselves, but there are a whole lot of other groups that are really important in these ecosystems that we could be looking at and that we should be looking at with the, given that we have these new techniques. So what about the microbes? These are the ones that are doing and responsible for, say, 70% of the nitrogen cycling happening in these systems. Can we look at those? And it's gonna, yep, one minute, great. Okay, so I'm gonna finish really quickly to show you what's happening with the microbes. These are, this is a $5 technique. So this is an ERISA sampling technique, DNA fingerprinting, extremely quick, doesn't give you taxonomic information, but does give you differences, OTUs, operational taxonomic units. And you can see really clear signatures of environmental impact in these microbial communities. If we look at, and I'm just gonna jump through, when we run the experimental studies to prove that what we're seeing in the survey work is actually being caused by some of the um, factors that we say are causing them, nutrient enrichment, metal enrichment, you can see that when we manipulate those, 
we get really clear interactions between two of these major stresses. And this is something that we should expect in all of our coastal ecosystems. All of them have had nutrient enrichment through agriculture, urbanisation and sewage input. All of them have also had metal inputs through industrial activity, sewage and urbanisation and ongoing inputs from stormwater. If you don't expect those two stresses to interact, then you don't know your chemistry, for starters. But the question is how they interact exactly hasn't really been tested at all. And so here we've got a clear example. When you add nutrients, that's all the blue-green ones, you shift the entire community this way. When you add metals to non-enriched systems, you have an impact, the impacts interact. That's exactly what we predict. Using metatranscriptomics, we can actually tell you how the entire system is shifting in terms of gene expression. So all of those metabolic functions that are being affected by the metals and the nutrients can now be assessed using metatranscriptomics, exact measures and actual relative abundances of the expression of these genes, which means for the first time we're actually getting ecosystem function at the same time as we're getting the taxonomic information about the structure of these communities from a single monitoring approach. And I think this is to end very quickly and you're going to miss the microplastics dessert. I thought that might happen. Um, but if you want to ask me about microplastics, I can tell you later. But to finish, what we need in our estuaries and our coastal environments are tools, diagnostic tools, that really give us information about ecosystem integrity and health. Some of these new molecular techniques, alongside the conventional approaches we might use for, say, looking at larval fish, looking at cellular biomarkers, these techniques can, right now, give us very important information that could be feeding into development applications, impact assessments, ongoing environmental monitoring, and the sustainable development of our coast, which is, over the next 10 to 20 years, going to face increasing pressures, not only from the ongoing changes to climate, but also from Australia loving our coast to death. Thank you very much.